God blew into man's nostrils for the first time that there was no such thing as a circulatory system. Yeah, yeah, blood was discovered in Genesis as, as talking to God after, murder, after the murderous interaction between Cain and Abel. You remember when God questioned Cain as to where his brother was, and, and, and Cain wanted to, you know, say, well, am I my brother's keeper? And, and God wanted him to know, I could hear his blood speaking up or crying up from the ground. The blood of animals was used in the rituals and sacrifices to bring peace between God and man. In the Old Testament, any time man sinned, something had to die in order to bring man back together with God. And, and blood was also used to, and, and sprinkled between the carcasses of bullocks and then walked upon in order to bring peace between man and man. In other words, if James and Calvin had fallen out with each other, they, they would have to slay a bullock, they would have to sprinkle the blood, and both of them would have to walk through that blood in order to bring peace back with them. The blood was used as an anti-death angel ointment upon the doorposts when Pharaoh continued to hold Israel hostage. You can remember how God told every house to slay a lamb and told them how he wanted them to roast that lamb, but take the blood from the lamb and put it over the doorpost because the death angel was going to march through Egypt on that night and only where he saw the blood would the death angel pass over? Brothers and sisters, blood is important because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. Yeah, blood is not just important in the Old Testament, but it is literally the reason why you and I gather together in this place of worship because the blood has called us together for worship. Most of us are not related to each other by birth, but all of us who are born again are related to each other by the blood of Jesus Christ. Most of us don't live in the same neighborhood, but all of us are summoned together to worship by the blood. Most of us, if not all of us, are not the same age. Some of us are older, some of us are younger, but we all are moved together to worship God who woke us up this morning by the blood of Jesus Christ. Most of us don't even have the same denominational or religious background. Some of us used to be Methodist, some of us used to be Pentecostal, but the one thing we have to understand is that all of us have come to this place to worship by the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus to the church is the lifeline or the livelihood of the church. Because without the blood of Jesus, our church would kind of dissolve to, to be in just a 501c3 corporation that happened to meet here on Sunday morning. Yeah, yeah, without the blood of Jesus, we, we come together on Sunday morning without joy, without peace, without protection, without provision, and without completion. Without the blood of Jesus, we are no more than a conglomeration of titles, dignitaries, and social strata. Without the blood of Jesus, quiet is saint, without the anointing, preachers can give a great oratory. Prayers are made that are confined to the ceiling, and all of us would be journeying to the same destination, which is hell. Without the blood, songs are meaningless. Praises are impotent. Services are uninspired. Houses of worship are nothing more than historic relics. Prayer is outdated. Giving it is a bad investment, and our time together is wasted all without the blood of Jesus. The Apostle John, who has not only authored the Gospels of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation, John, the, the beloved disciple, had saggingly advice for not only the modern church of his day, but also the modern church of today to make sure that we don't get too far away from the significant foundation of our faith. 
So he opens up this portion of this pericope, and I want to kind of explain this text and deal with this text, if you will, just with you the three familiar hymns of the church. My first point is going to be walk in the light. Y'all remember that hymn, walk in the light, the beautiful light. My, my second point is going to be what a fellowship. And my third point, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Yeah, let's first of all look at walk in the light. Look what the scripture says. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light. Now, now, now walking in the light, the, the, the element in which God himself is, constitute the, the, the fellowship or constitute the test of our fellowship with him. In other words, when it said walk in the light as he is in the light, you ought to start that off by saying, because he is in the light, we ought to walk in the light. Okay? And, and so that, that's the testament of our fellowship with him. You, you see, Christ, like us, walks in the light. And, and walking in the light as he is in the light, it is no mere imitation of God, but an identity in the essential element of our daily walk with the essential elements of the God's, of God's eternal being. Now there are two walks with God. There's a right walk and there's a wrong walk. Yeah, a false walk or a wrong walk or, or a false fellowship with him is not an authentic walk. It's an imitated walk, if you will. In other words, it looks real, but it lacks living of the truth of his word. I, I, I made a pecan pie yesterday, and, and my recipe calls for one fourth teaspoon of vanilla flavor. And I looked in the can to get what I thought was authentic vanilla flavor. But it says imitation. Say amen, y'all. Ladies know what I'm talking about. It, it looks real, but it lacks the living of the truth of his word. John, John is trying to, to get us to understand that your walk and your talk has got to be one. If you say you love the Lord, then you got to walk like you love the Lord. Huh? you got to talk like you love the Lord. Yeah, yeah. So when you look at that word walk in, in, in the Greek, you know, it comes from that Greek word peripateo, which means to walk or to tread, but it means to do so figuratively. Let, let me see if I can get you to understand that because when I was working with this, and, and it, I didn't get all that I got, you know, before God took me back to it this morning. When, when I was sitting in my office. So, so let's look at that what it means to walk with him figuratively. It means that when I walk in my spiritual life, he's walking with me. Huh? And in my heart and in my mind, I visualize that Jesus is walking with me. You don't see it. But with my visible, my, 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 my spiritual life, I'm just visualizing that as I walk in the light, Jesus is right there walking with me. And, and let me tell you something, because so, so many times we think that, you know, that there are times when the Lord is not with us, but not just on Sunday morning in the sanctuary, but the Lord is with me all week long, all day long, all night long, no matter where the place or the hour, the Lord is walking with us. And so John wants you to walk in the light. And, and so, if I'm walking in the light, and, and, and that's from the word pulse, which we get the word photo or phone, it means that the true knowledge of God and spiritual things are Christian piety. But for this instance, it means that the idea of, of holiness predominates as God and those who come, and, and God and those who conform to Him. In other words, our walking in the light has benefits. Walking in the light of the Lord produces two things. It produces light and fellowship. Say light and fellowship. 
So, so, so we got walk in the light. Now let's look at fellowship. What a fellowship. Because our walk in the light and, 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 and to have fellowship with him coincides with each other. Walking in the light and having fellowship with him. Now, our fellowship with him and our fellowship with each other should coincide as well. Because y'all know how hard we work to fellowship with each other. I mean, we're gone, but we don't work as hard to fellowship with each other. And so just like I walk in fellowship with God, I also have to have the instruction that I have to walk in fellowship with my fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord. And I'm quite sure one of the new words in the Christian today is the word koinonia. And in the Greek it means to share in, to fellowship with, by participation. Because you know what we usually stop with that word coming here. We stop with sharing in fellowship. But we forget about the participation with. What, what are you saying, Reverend? Well, what I'm saying is that, that if you say that, that, that you are sharing with me and calling me up in fellowship, then why aren't we participating together? You, you can't fellowship alone. You, you can't fellowship in your own little corner. You can't have church in your home and call that fellowship. Because there is no participation with nobody else. You can't boycott church and say, I'm going to fellowship at home. Who are you fellowshipping with? It's not something you can do by yourself. You, you can do a lot of things by yourself, but you can't fellowship by yourself. What you gonna do, high five yourself? You see, th this work is underscored by participation, by communion, and by fellowship. Well, what a fellowship in, in the gospel, or rather, it is in the gospel, it's, it, it's with other believers. Conversely, your fellowship is also important to God. You see, you can't experience fellowship with God and not have fellowship with each other. This is a command. As a matter of fact, it's an imperative text. Even when you come to church, don't sit on by yourself. Don't be rude and not speak to somebody else. Don't keep your head down and in some cell phone or, or, or some other electronic device, but you need the fellowship. How can you come in, step over me, sit down next to me, and don't fellowship with me? Don't even say good morning. Don't even say praise the Lord, hallelujah, how you doing? Fellowship with one another. It is really of a, of a, of a reciprocal nation. Or another nation. It comes from that, that Greek word, uh, oleon. And it, it's when you fellowship with someone who is just like you, not physically, not in appearance, but in spirit. Huh? In, in other words, that person sitting next to you ought to be like you in spirit. Huh? Hope y'all saved. So why can't y'all just get along? Hmm? It, it, it is when you fellowship with somebody. You, you shouldn't have to work so hard to find another believer in this church. As a matter of fact, you're sitting on the left of one. You're sitting on the right of one. There's one behind you. There's one in front of you. And if you turn either way, you can look in somebody's face that's saved just like you. And so without having fellowship with God, there can be no true and Christian fellowship with one another. And this question is not to supply proof of the fellowship with, 
the brethren, but it is the state of consequences of walking in the light. In other words, what it's saying is, if you walk in the light, as he is in the light, you can't help but have fellowship. One with another. And so if you are having a problem having fellowship, it might be because you ain't walking in the light. As he is in the light. Huh? Yeah, you see, that the question is not a proof. And, and to keep this fellowship is not a light matter. It, it is the fruit of walking in the light of the fellowship with God of a holy life and a holy aspiration. Because you see, sin separates, sin impedes, and constantly destroys that fellowship. Did you know that every time we sin, every time we come short of the glory of God, we, we kind of destroy that fellowship? Mm -hmm. Not only with God, but with one another. But here comes the third point. Nothing but the blood. You see, blood is the, is the substantial basis of individual life. You can live without food. You can live without arms, you can live without vision, you can live without fingers, but you can't live without the blood. The Bible says in Leviticus 17 and 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Huh? Yeah, the existence of the blood of Christ is also the blood of the New Testament. The New Testament in his blood, which, which designate the life of Christ Offered as an, for an atonement, contrast with the blood of peace in the sacrifice. And I'm going to make a contrast with that. Because the blood of Christ, therefore, represents the life that he gave for our atonement. Say atonement. You see, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin. But guess what it does? It also brings up a question. Because sometimes, you know, not very folk ask this silly question. They say, well, he only died once. Isn't that blood dried up by now? Isn't his blood obsolete by now? The answer to that is that his blood is different from our blood. Because his blood is eternal. His blood is flowing. His blood still reaches, still restores, and still responds. That, that, that fountain of blood is still flowing in 2014. We all have sin, but only those who walk in the light are continuously clean. But let me say it again. Cause, cause, cause when I was sitting at my desk this morning, the Lord really helped me. What I said is, we all sin, but only those who are walking in the light are continuously being clean all the time. Mm -hmm. Not just once, but it's a continuous action. 30 years ago, when, when the Lord saved you and cleansed you, that got rid of past sin, present sin, and, and it stood for future sin. But in order for it to help you in the future, you got to walk in the light. John says, Jesus' blood cleanses us. Well, which is what? Present tense. Huh? In other words, his blood is the agent. In, in the natural, you would never expect blood to be a cleansing agent. Huh? Yeah, I, I tried it. The blood will not clean. Mine won't clean. My blood cannot clean the kitchen. If I took my blood and went in the kitchen and started Trying to clean up, everything will be messed up. My blood will not clean the living room. My blood can't clean my car. But his blood, Jesus' blood, can clean every stain. Yeah, his blood can clean every sin stain from my life, past, present, and future. And there's not a spot that I can create that Jesus cannot clean me from. Let me say that again. That is not a spot that you can create in your life, that sin can create, that the blood of Jesus cannot cleanse 
you from? Him I was just asked the question, what can wash? Away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You see, my, my sins are, are, are daily contracted through the sinful weakness of the flesh. Paul said, when I would do good, evil is present. So not only is it through the weakness of the flesh, but also through the power of Satan and the world. Satan always messing with you. Satan always trying to get you to do this and do that. Yeah, but you got to understand that, that here God is speaking not of justification through his blood once and for all, but of the present sanctification. Cleanses is in the present tense with which the believer walking in the light and having fellowship with God and the saints enjoy his privileges. In other words, what he's saying is if I'm walking in the light, and I got fellowship with God and with one another. His blood is constantly cleansing me from all of my sin. That, that's the privilege. Now, when you look at John 13 and 10, yeah, yeah, yeah. He that has been bathed, Jesus was talking to Peter when, when Jesus was up in the upper room and you want to wash feet. Peter told you, won't wash my feet. Jesus said, if I want to wash your feet, now you don't have no part with me. And then Peter said, not only my feet, Lord, but my head, you know, and, and all of me. And now let me let me explain that to you. Because what he's saying here is that he that has been made, Jesus told him, he did not be saved or wash his feet, but is cleansed every whip. In other words, what he's saying here, watch this now. He's saying that when you bathe and you wash everything from your head down to your ankles, what you're doing is you're cleansing that. But if I walk from here over here with, with sandals or barefooted, I'm going to get some more dirt on me. So no matter how much I've been washed up here, I need to wash my feet because I'm constantly picking up dirt. And so what he was saying is, when you were baptized, when you were saved, you were cleansed, you were made purified, but because you walk every day, you're walking in sin, you're walking in dust, your feet are getting dirty, and even if your body has been washed, every now and then through repentance, you need to be washed all over again. The problem with some of us here, we still living on that salvation we got 30 years ago. And we ain't repenting since then. Because we don't think we've sinned. We don't know nobody that has ever sinned. We ain't even kin to nobody. And so, so, so what he's saying is that, that Christ's blood is the cleansing means whereby, you know, gradually being already justified in this fellowship, I'm already saved. Huh? And I become clean from sin. Huh? But every now and then, because of my sin, I'll mark my fellowship. That's why sometimes when you come to church, it's hard for you to get in service. Huh? Because faith applies the cleansing, purifying blood. The shedding of Christ's blood was necessary for the sanctification of God's justice. Say justice. You see, our sins, your, your sin, my sin, could not go, you know, without, you know, uh, propitiation, which means a, a turning away of anger by the offering of the gift. Okay. And, 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 and there's a Greek word, hilasmos, damn, and, and, and that, that's the word for propitiation. Let me, let, me, let me just give you an example by using what they did in those days. There were folk who served idol gods, and they believed that the idol gods would get angry with them because of their sins. And in order to appease the gods, because they said every time somebody got sick, oh, God was angry with them. Every time something bad happens, we God is angry with us. So what we need to do is we need to offer the, something to the gods so that the gods won't be angry with us, or at least they will he will delay his punishment. Huh? And so what they did, they got a well-chosen offering that would appease the gods and put him in a good mood again. That process was called propitiation. And we've heard it oftentimes. 
Now, watch this. As believers, there is only one offering that will appease the Father and put God in a good mood. Huh? And that is the blood of Jesus, who is not only our propitiation, but he volunteered to be it. Now, 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 let me tell you, I've never seen any lambs and rams and bullocks who just willingly got in line and said, go ahead, cut my throat, take my blood, let me be the sacrifice. No, but Jesus volunteered to be the sacrifice. Can you get a witness? In, in, in other words, he, he said, no man take my life, but I lay it down. Yeah, yeah, this is the blood of Jesus. An animal never lined up and volunteered. Not only, uh, he not only offered his blood as the propitiation of sacrifice, but guess what? He also officiated as the high priest. Can you imagine that? Y'all got to see this. In the Old Testament, when they offered lambs and the blood of lambs, that there was a high priest who had to take that blood and sprinkle it and spread it. But guess what? Not only did Jesus offer himself as the sacrifice, but he also served as the high priest. So the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in shedding his blood, both as victim and high priest, is found in that, that Greek verb in Hebrew 2 and 17, which means to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. And so in other words, Jesus paid the necessary price huh, for the expiation or the atonement, purification of removing sin and or its guilt. That's the point right there. When Jesus became our sacrifice, he not only removed our sin, but he removed the guilt of the sin. So if he removed the sin and the guilt, why are you still losing sleep over what you did 10 years ago? Over what you did last week and last month? Once you repent of your sins and he removed the sin, he not only took away the sin, but he took away the guilt. And, and you know what I like about it? It's not temporary. It's permanent. Can you get a witness? Not only is it permanent, but it's unrestricted. Say amen if you will. In, in the Old Testament, the high priest sprinkled the blood of, of an expiratory victim on the mercy seat. That, that way the place, uh, or that was the place where, you know, expiation or expectation took place. But for our redemption, the cross was the place. Can you get a witness? You don't have to worry about no mercy seat. Ours were paid for on the cross. Please allow me to say it in the vernacular of the saints. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross and the emblem of suffering and shame. In other words, it was at the cross. But Jesus paid the price for our sins. And after Jesus bore his cross through the streets of Jerusalem at Golgotha, the place of a skull, he himself became the sacrifice. They nailed his hands to the cross. They nailed his feet to the cross. They put the crown of corn on his head. And he died for your sins and mine. Can I get away this here? He died to become our sacrifice. Yes, brothers and sisters, he died as my substitute. He died as my propitiation. They buried him in a borrowed grave. He stayed there all Friday night. He stayed there all day Saturday and all Saturday night. But every Sunday morning, he got us with all powers in his hands. He shook off his great clothes. He stood on the square and said, All power is in my hands. That's what 
because the blood uh, has power. Uh, the blood uh, has wonder working power. Uh, the blood uh, has healing power. Uh, the blood uh, has resurrection power. Uh, the blood uh, has holding on power. Uh, changing power uh, and power uh, to help you to walk right. Power uh, to help you to talk right. Power. Uh, I said it. Thank you. 
Every day 